case of is an enormous stairway, which would have taken you up to the top of what we think is the, the palace or the plantation house or the big house. Even the modern sense, a very palatial kind of construction. They've dubbed the site Stairway to Heaven. A place like Stairway to Heaven is amazing in the sense that they built a nine, 10 room mansion up there. I mean, that's a very nice building, you know, a, a ninth century McMansion, okay, living up on top of that hill. Really? But who would have been rich enough and audacious enough to build such over the top real estate? Archaeologist Stephanie Sims is digging for answers, tearing up the floor of one of the 22 large stone buildings that make up the estate. Under the floor, a tantalizing clue. Here I am sitting beneath the floor, level being right here, of a three-room elite residence up on the hilltop. And uh, here, just beneath the floor, are a, a few capstones covering a dedicatory offering. The offering consists of a ceramic bowl and plate that appear to have been placed under the floor when the house was built. It's a little suspicious that it would be odd to, to place a plate upside down like that without covering something, so. As the team carefully removes the plate, specks of evidence surface. Little teeny fragments of very badly decomposed, kind of eroded, degraded bone. Still can't tell yet whether it's human bone or animal bone, but my guess is human. The large capstones flanking the offering may be hiding something else. It was common practice of the Maya to rebury the defleshed bones of their deceased ancestors. It's called secondary burial. Our thinking with these secondary burials is that they're bringing bones or parts of uh, family members to new locations to sanctify the, the structures that they're building. The capstones under the floor of the house come off. A human tooth. Confirming our suspicions that this is a human burial. This is a lower incisor right here. There are several, and we're still waiting to uncover to see how many there are. Though badly decomposed from the acidic soil, Stephanie can make out the remains of a human skull and arm and leg bones. So this demonstrates to us this offering as part of the, the, the burial underneath dedicating this house. Back in the lab, Stephanie happily discovers that this skull's owner was not a daily brusher or flosser. Embedded in the teeth, 1,200-year-old plaque. Chemical analysis of food particles in the plaque gives Stephanie a hint about what kind of wealth Stairway's owners had. I'm finding a much greater diversity of plant food items that were consumed, ingredients in stews and soups, squash, beans, tree fruits, chili peppers. The bounty suggests that the people who lived at Stairway were major plantation owners, operating extensive farms in the valley below their hilltop estate. As George's team surveys nearby hills, it's clear that Stairway is not an isolated example, but one of dozens of estates. Indicators of widespread wealth start to emerge. Many secondary buildings at sites like Stairway Houses belonging to skilled workers like this one are built of stone, a rarity in ancient Central America. 
That's amazing. What it suggests is that we're not looking at a uh, large peasant population that's uh, under the hands of a very small royal elite, but that wealth and prosperity have spread over almost half of the population. Kiwik may be evidence of America's very first middle class nearly a millennium before North America's colonial middle class. These people might have had opportunities. They might have been able to acquire land. I mean, it's kind of fun to think about it, that they might have been living the Maya dream. If there was such a thing as the Maya dream, this is where it happened. Kiwi and Stairway are nestled in a lush region of the Yucatan, called the Pook. Soil here is fertile, natural resources abundant. It looks like an ideal place for human habitation, except for one thing. The Pook region has no water sources, no rivers, lakes, streams, creeks. These people depended on controlling, collecting, and managing rainwater. So how did they do it? Just a few hundred feet from the Stairway Estate House, archaeologist Bill Ringel has found an answer. Water falls heavily here, but only six months of the year. For the rest of the time, it dries out and virtually no rain falls. And this was one of the primary adaptations of the Puk Maya to this rather waterless environment. This underground cavern is actually a man-made cistern called a chultun. It was a work of sophisticated engineering carved out of the limestone bedrock. Over here, we can see how the, these chultuns were constructed. First of all, they would bore through the harder cap rock, and then once they got in, under to this uh, underlying softer marl, they would excavate out uh, and make this large chamber. The last stage would be to, to uh, cover it with stucco, and you can see the thickness of the stucco here, this, this pinkish material. The stucco functioned as a waterproof lining. The Maya expertly engineered the patios, rooftops, and plazas of Stairway to Heaven to capture every last drop of rainwater. Then, drained it into eight choltuns scattered throughout the estate. The entire hilltop functioned as a giant rain barrel. So how many people could this ingenious waterworks support? Bill Ringel and engineer Andrew Willis use an early version of LiDAR technology to map the Chultun. The resulting 3D model allows them to calculate water capacity. Up to 10,000 gallons in each of the stairways Chultuns provided a reliable source of water for the entire community. The typical family of six consume 27 gallons a day. So Stairway's Chultuns could have supported seven families through three rainless months. These advanced waterworks formed a liquid foundation for life on Stairway and for dozens of other wealthy kingdoms like Kiwi nearby. And sitting at the very top of that foundation was a royal elite. George Bay has found hints of their surprising wealth hidden in the jungle. The ruins of a majestic palace. It represents a time in the history of the, of the royal family of Kiwi a great amount of wealth was being accrued by the royal family, and they were expressing it uh, through the construction of a massive new palace. The 
the king of Kiwik had built the pyramid over his old palace. So on the adjacent lot, he upgraded to deluxe new accommodations. The new palace boasted 15 major buildings and two ceremonial plazas. From previous finds, George knows the buildings were adorned in ornate sculpture and painted stucco. This is one of the best preserved buildings in the new palace. You can see the remains of the stucco, but they would have been painted sometimes with elaborate murals. And then there would have been beams hung from certain parts of the roof for curtains or tapestries, and a variety of furniture would have uh, found its way in here. Kings like things like jaguar skin sofas, fancy pillows. This simple room would have perhaps been uh, quite luxurious. By 800 AD, the Northern Maya society is over 1,500 years old. Its people have mastered this harsh landscape. Their facility with water allows for large-scale farming and generates vast wealth for their kings and even for a new middle class. Imagine this place 800 AD. You would have seen the vast landscape of towns, villages, cities, the smoke rising from thousands of cooking fires as women prepare the evening meals men coming back from their fields. But along with this portrait of a prosperous society, Bay's colleagues, Bill Ringel and Tomas Gallerda, are finding evidence of a disturbing political trend on the rise. Twenty miles from Kiwik is the majestic city of Uzmal. In the 800s, it rose to become the powerful political capital of the region. Local kings, like the King of Kiwik, likely traveled here to conduct diplomacy and pay tribute to Uzmal's royalty. Ringel wants to show Bay how these buildings underwent a peculiar modification in the 800s. An unmistakable new image was added to their facades. What's really interesting is, is that little image right there. A feathered serpent. And actually there are two feathered serpents here and they intertwine across the facade. You need visual images. Ringel believes the serpents are a symbol of a powerful religious cult. It was called Quetzalcoatl, or the Feathered Serpent. The so-called cult of Quetzalcoatl, perhaps a better way to think about it, is a political ideology. And of course, it had religious overtones. Cult's perhaps the, the uh, wrong word because it suggests something kind of small scale and uh, extra governmental. This was political ideology, um, front and center. To gain admittance into this cult, a local king, like Kiwiks, had to submit to a rigorous initiation. And the priests would very often sequester the uh, initiate for several days. He would undergo rituals of self-mortification. Artwork from the time depicted rituals involving bloodletting ceremonies in which initiates pierced their penises and other body parts. And that would be a very interesting way to, uh, to sacrifice yourself, well, obviously very painful. <laughs> Another image on the facade represents the journey of an initiate, a small man being spit out of the mouth of a feathered serpent. We can see the little man moving through its body uh, to emerge as a transformed being. And he's being transformed precisely because of the rituals of initiation that involved Quetzalcoatl. 
The feathered serpent carvings at Uzmal suggest the cult swept through the north in the 800s. As local kings bought into the new ideology, political tensions started to rise. It may have fostered competition between those who wish to adhere to this new ideology and those who wish to remain true to the, the traditional ideology of, of the Maya area. At the new palace in Kiwik, George finds signs that in the midst of the boom times, something else seems to go wrong. We see this big pile of rock up here in front of the building, and it makes really not too much sense at the beginning. You have this beautiful building here on this side with these rooms. You have a set of rooms on the other side, and right in the middle you have a big chunk of rubble. We conclude that what we're looking at is a actual staircase that was built by workers uh, to give them access to the upper stories of the building. Here is a scaffold system being used by the Maya as part of the construction techniques. OK, now it's not gone. The stairway is still here. If the building was finished, they would have removed the stairway. The indications of this scaffolding are is that you're seeing construction happening. You're not seeing a finished building. Another part of Kiwik's palace shows similar signs of a sudden halt in construction. The second story walls of a building are laid out on the ground by masons, but never erected. All of these characteristics are evidence that the city was in full bloom, that architects were employed, that the king was feeling confident and powerful about what he was doing, that the city was part of a world that was uh, blossoming and expanding, and not um, this idea of uh, the king being Miss Havisham sitting among a, a ruined house as things slowly fell apart for him and his world uh, collapsed. This is a very different kind of uh, image for what was going on here. So what brought Kiwi's boom times to a screeching halt? At first, war seems an obvious explanation for the stoppage. But an exhaustive search turns up no arrowheads and no spear points. But then, at Stairway to Heaven, the hilltop estate, the team finds clues that at the same time construction halted on the palace, this site was abruptly abandoned. Wow, Evan, this is fantastic. You have um, probably five or six vessels smashed on the floor from the time of the abandonment. You know, I, I think some of them would have been left here on the floor. Others were probably hanging from the walls. But these people were not running for their lives. The evidence suggests an orderly departure. Pots carefully hung on wall pegs are set to the sides of rooms. They were left intact and only broke later as the abandoned building began to crumble. But it looks like most of them are right along the edges of the interior, which really looks like they're taking some time to put these vessels somewhere to guard them yeah. uh, at the time they're leaving them. Kind of like making things neat right before you leave the house. Right, kind of tidying up in some way. So what could have caused this carefully planned abandonment of stairway and the abrupt work stoppage at the palace? At Stairway to Heaven, data indicates cisterns would have armed the Maya for three months without rain a few months longer with emergency water rationing. But evidence from core samples suggests this would not have been enough. We find eight of these bands that suggests, in fact, that it wasn't just like one massive drought. It was probably a series of droughts that have uh, durations of about three to 20 years. And you know, every time things would get going again, they would get pounded with a, a fairly long duration drought. At some point, the droughts overwhelmed stairway, leaving only one option. 
all it would take would be a short period of time in which there is no water in those cisterns and those people would have to leave that hill. It's simply impossible to live there. The various families, elite families, they were reaching a point uh, where they were having to make a very difficult decision, which was to leave Stairway to Heaven. They loaded what they could of their lives onto their backs and carefully stored the rest. When the rains returned, they fully expected they would too. The Maya knew about droughts. They were probably a civilization designed to respond not only to managing rainwater, but managing a lack of rainwater too. It's not a surprise they left. What becomes the question for us is why they don't come back. So why didn't Stairway's residents and the King of Kiwik survive these droughts, as they clearly had in the past? The extreme intensity of these droughts was disastrous, making a carefully managed response their only hope. But Bay and Ringel speculate the North's political establishment was falling into disarray distracted by the cult of the feathered serpent. The collapse in the Northern Maya apparently began during the ninth century, and that's also the time period during which this feathered serpent ideology was introduced. And this undoubtedly led to rivalries with respect to, to, to power brokering. Ringel thinks the political situation may have become so extreme that there was no longer any governmental system capable of organizing their return. With a stable government, the Northern Maya might have survived, but it wasn't to be. And within a century, the major cities and towns of the North, just like the South, were left in ruins. Today, the empty jungles of the Yucatan serve as a reminder that even great civilizations can fail. As the years passed, slowly the jungle reclaimed these magnificent buildings. Whole towns and cities vanished under a green wave. They became secrets of the forest. Only now, thanks to new technology and fieldwork, can the extent of what was lost come into view? In the Americas before the Spanish conquest. But who exactly were the ancient Maya people and what led to the collapse of their civilization? 